Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with James Whiteside in conversation with Ari Shapiro discussing Center Center, a funny, sexy, sad, almost memoir of a boy in ballet. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with each other and the conversation in the chat area. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future and you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter, as well as following us on social media at BookSoup and you can also follow our Crowdcast page right here, and past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Also, please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. You can do that by clicking the green button right below the viewer's screen. It'll redirect you to our website where you can complete the checkout process, and they do come with signed book plates, and I think we might, I don't know where else you can possibly get those, so you should get them with Book Soup. And you can also get some fun limited book merch from James. I put the link in the bio or in the in the bio. God, I'm you can tell I run an Instagram. So I have a link um, in the chat area. And then I also have a link if you prefer audiobook. Um, we're also selling through Libro FM. So you can support Book Soup or your independent bookstore through them as well. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. James Whiteside, alter egos JB Dubs and Yuhu Betch, is a principal dancer with American Ballet Theater, a pop star, and a member of the NYC-based drag posse, The Dairy Queens, which also includes RuPaul's Drag Race alum, Milk. He has choreographed for music videos, commercials, film, and ballet, and in 2018, he starred in Arthur Pita's dance theater work, The Tenant at the Joyce Theater in New York City. Whiteside also hosts his own popular podcast, The Stage Right Side with James Whiteside. His song and music video, I Hate My Job, has been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, MTV, Billboard, and more. And our in-conversation guest tonight, Ari Shapiro, has been one of the hosts of NPR's award-winning All Things Considered since 2015. Shapiro has filed stories from dozens of countries and most of the 50 states, including four years as NPR's White House correspondent during Barack Obama's two terms. An occasional singer, Shapiro makes frequent guest appearances with Pink Martini. Shapiro has performed live at many of the world's most storied venues from Hollywood to Paris. And in 2019, he created the show Auk and Oi with Tony Award winner Alan Cumming, and they continue to tour the country with it. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to James and Ari. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, and please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you, Book Soup, for having us. Hi, James. How you doing? Ari, oh my goodness, I'm so good. I have a book. You have a book. I'm so excited to talk to you about this. I was trying to hold it up and realizing it just looks like a washed out white square on my screen. Yeah, I can do um, mine. Doesn't that oh, look you can do yours. Good? That's better. I'm coming to you from a hotel room in Astoria, Oregon, where I'm on vacation on the Oregon coast. And I had to carve time out of my time away from work to talk to you about this book because I loved it. So before we talk about the book itself, I just want to ask, these essays have like been in your head and on your laptop screen for so long now, what does it feel like to actually have them out in the world and have people reading them? Oh my goodness, it's terrifying. I don't yeah. know talk about these things. So to know that people are learning about me without really having me involved stresses me out a lot. Uh, but yeah. I'm trying to let it go, let it roll, be cool. And uh, I'm doing okay. The response has been incredible. Everybody I've seen has loved it from the Washington Post on down. Um, and I've been friends with you for years and learned so much about you from this book, starting with like, when I met you, you were doing the tenant at the Joyce theater. You were already a principal ballet dancer with the ABT. And so I just sort of assumed that you had like star emblazoned across your chest from the very first ballet class you ever took. And I was surprised to learn in reading this, that actually you were not the top of your class every time you stepped up to the bar and in fact maybe it would be overstating it to say failed out of like the abt summer program but certainly like that did not lead you to stardom can you talk about some of the early setbacks that you had in your career absolutely i was a scrappy little puppy i was uh easily distracted 
by whatever, by social life, by boys, you name it. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was dealing with my own sexuality and feeling inadequate in ballet. People were so much better than I was. They had different types of training than I did. And uh, I did American Ballet Theater's summer program for two years straight. And at the, the end of the second year, I got a letter from American Ballet Theater saying I was no longer welcome back. They weren't seeing what they needed to see. And that was that. And I was devastated because ABT has always been my dream company. So, and at that point, did you think that was the end of your ballet career? Were you like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to go into real estate instead? Or like, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with real estate, but... No, 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 no. Uh, absolutely not. I knew I knew I could do it in a, in a very sure way. I knew I wasn't the best, and I didn't ever think I would be the best, and I still don't think I'm the best, but I knew I, think I you're had... The best. Oh, my God, stop it. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew I had something worth fighting for, and I love ballet, and I still do, and, and it, was, it was really important to me to try. I mean, can I just drill down for a, a minute more with you into the moment that you're told you're not invited back, and you say, well, fuck it, I'm going to double down and find a different path forward? Like, what, what does that require in you? I think I am competitive, and knowing that I was losing opportunities to other people really pissed me off. Mm. I could identify even as a teenager that I wasted time and opportunity and I was disappointed in myself. And I had a decent amount of perspective considering I was 16 years old. And yeah. I, I looked at other people and I saw the way they were doing it. And I was like, well, that's not how I'm doing it. Maybe I need to try something else. Maybe I need to try harder and uh, behave myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, clearly that lesson didn't stick. <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, there's this amazing moment where like several years later, you had been dancing in Boston, you'd been killing it. You get an audition with ABT, you go and they're like, yes, we want you. And then what happens? You get this call and they're like, well, actually, tell us, tell us what went down. So I had been in Boston Ballet for 10 years. I went from the rank of apprentice at 18 years old to principal dancer. And I was 28 when I got a call from my ballet mentor, uh, Raymond Lukens, and he said, ABT needs men, why don't you come audition? And so I sent my materials into ABT and I was like, okay, this is my moment. They, they said, yes, come take class. And it was in the middle of a very arduous run of the Nutcracker in Boston. We did like a thousand shows. And I had one day off and I zipped down to New York City on the Fung Wah bus and I slept on my brother's couch <laughs> in the Lower East Side. And uh, I got up really early and made my way to the Flatiron you know, district and took ballet class mm -hmm. with American Ballet Theater. And I saw all the people from my summer program days. A lot of them were the stars of ABT now, you know, and I was just like, this is wild. It felt like a homecoming, but I hadn't gotten the job yet. So at the end of the class, the artistic associate director said, come up to the director's office. We'd like to talk. And I was like, oh, what's happening? And I sat down in, in the room with them and they said, James, we think you've got something. We'd like to offer you a soloist contract. And I said, ah! and I was very excited. There's more to the story though. Okay, I know you know. And soloist is like, just so people know, there's like principal soloist core, right? That's kind of the hierarchy. Yes. So I was already okay. a principal dancer in Boston Ballet for years. And so I was willing to take a step down to soloist rank to be in my dream company, the company I dreamt about being since I, uh, being in since I was 12 years old. So I left there super happy, like, yes, I cannot believe this is happening to me. I'm so excited. And then, you know, two weeks later, I got a call from the director of ABT. James, hey, listen, um, I'm really sorry, but 
you know, we need you to take a corps de ballet contract. Uh, we, we, you know, we don't think a it's- step down the right from time. the soloist position they had offered you. Yeah, so corps de ballet is the base, uh, the base rank. So I was going from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, let me think about that. And, uh, you know, I, I got off the phone and I, I called him back, I think the next day, I don't quite remember, honestly. And I said, you know, I can't, I can't go that far backwards. I, I'm not playing chicken anymore and uh, I'm very sorry, but I can't do that. And he said, okay, I understand. And then about 20 minutes later, he called me back and he said, okay, solo is this. And in your mind, when you turn down Corps de Ballet, were you like, I'm gonna call his bluff? Or were you just like, this is not a thing I can do? No, no, no. I had no idea that I was negotiating. <laughs> it just <laughs> felt like it just felt like I was standing my ground, and I was like, "What is? I don't want to start over again." Like I have been grinding yeah. to get to principal yeah. in Boston. Like I was happy to grind to maybe be a principal in ABT after being a soloist, but not to climb two ranks. Who knows how long that would take? And I, I just. Dancers don't have that much time. Um, so no, I was not calling his bluff. I was just resigned to the fact that it just didn't work out. One of the reasons I think it's so worth talking about like these kinds of moments in your career is that I think that it's, there's just not enough conversation about failure uh, among people who look up to, like people who have achieved great things the way you have we rarely hear the stories of all of the ways in which like they really had to fight and claw their way through all kinds of setbacks in order to get to where they were. And this book does a lot of things, but one of the things that I think it does so well is show like the ugliness behind the beauty and the sweat behind the appearance of effortlessness, if you know what I mean. Was that part of your motivation among the many other things that you were trying to do in, in putting these essays together? No. Honestly, I was just <laughs> giving honest, honest, uh, honest tales. I wanted to show how I got here without sort of, I don't know, I didn't want it to feel tedious. I wanted concise yeah. little stories about how I got to where I'm at. And that includes, in reality, some real setbacks, some disappointment, yeah. some, some devastation in some cases. Uh, and then yeah. for the rest of the book, I just wanted to, I wanted to explore my version of writing, like what it feels mm -hmm. good to write like for me. I don't know, as, yeah. as I have horrible English right now. <laughs> no, 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 I know exactly what you mean because your voice is so vivid in the book and it sounds so much like you. You have such a distinctive style. Um, and I, 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 I wanna let everybody who's watching and listening tonight know that, um, the book is about so much more than ballet and we're going to discuss much more than ballet. Um, but while it is, as the book describes, a memoir of a boy in ballet or almost memoir of a boy in ballet, there's so much more to it than the world of dance and what we've been talking about so far. This is also a good moment for me to say, please jump in with any questions you have, whether they are questions about the book specifically, if you've read it, or just general questions you've always wanted to ask James, now is your opportunity. And once you put them in, we'll see them, you can upvote them you know how this goes. Um, one of the things that I just find so shocking, and your book didn't, wasn't the first time I had heard this, but it still amazes me, is just how bizarrely heteronormative ballet is. That like, it is this art form that is basically kept alive by aging queens. And yet for you to be like an out proud, queer, gay person at the highest levels of ballet is kind of unheard of. Gosh, I don't, I don't know what to say to that. Yes, I know. Jeez. <laughs> um, I, I wish I wasn't so unique in the noise I make. Um, hmm. I, has it changed in the year? Because you've been so public for so many years. Do you think this has changed? I'm not going to say solely because of you, but at least in part because of the noise you've made. I don't know. I know that the culture at ABT has changed. Um, 
I, I'm really just open and free. And I mean, it's a real comfortable atmosphere. People talk about things that you wouldn't be able to, to talk to at Goldman's, talk about at Goldman Sachs or at like a, mm -hmm. a corporate job. It's a free, very free spirited atmosphere of artists. If you get a bunch of artists together and, and lines will be crossed. Um, <laughs> but like, there was one line in the book that I was like, oh, that is so sad, where you said that every boy who is studying ballet has like at some point been told by a ballet instructor that the retort when they are mocked is, well, I get to spend all day around girls in leotards. Like, and you're just running around with sweaty boys playing soccer or something like that. Like, what a sad statement that is, that every boy who has studied ballet knows that that is the retort that they are supposed to give when they are mocked for, for being a boy in ballet. Exactly, and it makes me sad that I never did soccer. <laughs> it's not too late. You still could. I want to be a, around a bunch of sweaty dudes. I, I mean, I think you are. Um, yeah, but there are a lot of straight, I mean, it's it's not bad that there are a lot of straight people. Let me just preface this by, there aren't as many gay people or queer people for that matter in ballet as one might imagine. It is misleadingly hetero. And that like, that just confuses me because it's, it appeals to me on such a gay level. Yeah, yeah, same. Um, part of what, I, so I'm trying to find a transition here. That heteronormativity and that sort of like the confines of ballet sort of forced you, not forced you, but gave you opportunities to find other outlets of creative expression, which comes up in this book and uh, has been part of what I think has made you such an interesting person beyond the ballet stage, whether it's drag or pop music. And there was a line that I loved so much where you talk about staying in your lane but having a couple invisible lanes alongside them and i was like i identify so strongly with that as somebody who is like you know working in radio and journalism but also moonlighting with a band like pink martini um did you ever feel like oh is this going to undermine my my credibility the way people view me as an artist the like brand of james the ballet dancer Absolutely. Because I've certainly felt that way. Like, I wondered, is this going to undermine my credibility as a journalist? Yes, I've felt that way a really long time. Um, that's been a, a, a very real fear ever since I, I stepped out of the, you know, the dancer mystique path. Mm -hmm. um, I think everything that I do outside of classical ballet uh, at this point supports what I do in classical ballet. It makes me unique. Um, however, it takes a long time for people to accept uniqueness. And then once they do, it becomes the thing you're celebrated for. So it takes a oh, lot- interesting. It takes a lot of dedication on, on the part of, of the artist or the person perhaps challenging norms uh, because it takes time. And it's so funny, the things I felt judged for, oh, he's not a serious artist. He's not really focused in ballet, which is a farce. I work outrageously hard and mm -hmm. ballet is a passion. And I can tell you that all you want, but you know, you have to witness it to believe it. Um, but once people get over it, they're like, oh, this is so cool. He can do this and he can do this. I mean, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> when you say that it actually helps your ballet career, clearly there's something about like, it makes you a more interesting person, character, artist. Does it also influence the way you approach a traditional ballet? That was a tugboat that you might have just heard outside. I'm on the Oregon coast, as I might have mentioned. Um, it's just honking away outside the window here. I can't um, hear it. Okay, great. Well, so I wonder if in addition to people being like, oh, he also does this, does what you do with drag and with pop music and other things influence the way you approach 
the more sort of staid world of ballet. I mean, I do, all the roles I do are straight men. So uh, a lot of what I do is an escape from playing straight all the time, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. But everything I do from a story sense is informed by all the culture I take in. Uh, so like I do story ballets, I, I act, I do front to back, tell the story, make people believe it or make them engaged somehow. Um, yeah. Everything I consume via society uh, is sort of injected into all of that. I, I use things I see to, I don't know, from an inside out kind of way to figure out how I want to portray roles and characters. I don't know, that Do sounds a little like mumbo yes. jumbo-y. No, 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 I get that. But I also wonder, like we hear so many conversations about how to make classical music or opera or what have you relevant to a younger audience. Is there a way, could you imagine a world in which Yuhu Bitch and J-Dubs don't have to be an escape from ballet, but can be somehow integrated into a wider world of ballet that attracts an audience that is maybe younger, more diverse, et cetera, than the traditional ABT subscriber base. Absolutely. I think every every art form needs an evolution. Needs like if Madonna can have like a, a, a hundred eras, I think so can ballet. Um, Do you think it's I, open to that though? Do you see resistance to that change? I think I see resistance to spending money. Mm -hmm. New work costs money, yeah. especially the type of work that ABT does. We do big story ballets, and new productions cost millions of dollars. And it takes, it takes people with a lot of money to make things like that happen. And sometimes people with a lot of money don't want to see a big gay ballet for $3 million. Okay, but Matthew Bourne's Swan Lake ran on Broadway. Admittedly, that was like more than a decade ago, but still, like somebody took a risk, somebody made a big gay ballet, and it was a commercial smash hit, right? Like, why, why isn't everybody trying to throw their money at the next that? Well, Matthew Bourne created that as an individual. So he had people investing in an individual's production. ABT yeah. answers to a huge board, um, and and this is just the reality, like the business of nonprofit. It's yeah. It's it's just not so black and white as an individual's work being supported by big donors. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to the book and to your alter egos. There was another line in this that I loved, where you said, "I believe normalcy to be an insidious evil," which I underlined. Can you talk more about that? Yes. Okay. So what I my point with that statement is to be overly comfortable helps nobody. Uh, in order to push yourself, you have to challenge yourself. You have to be challenged. And I think in order to learn, you have to be constantly challenged and pushed. And I'm just going to say those words over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you can be challenged and pushed to be the best ballet dancer in the mold of all the ballet dancers who came before you. And it's something different to be like, yeah, you know what, I'm also gonna be like this wild electronic musician and this drag queen that is sort of boundary breaking and norms defying. And there's, there's something about deviating from normalcy that is different from just being like better and being challenged. Yeah, I think it also has something to do with being good at a couple things, you know, no one would care that I was a drag queen if I was a really awful ballet dancer, hmm. but I've worked really hard. Oh, I thought you were gonna say if I was a really awful drag queen. <laughs> well, I'm sort of a really awful drag queen actually, but I'm very- In a wonderful good. way, awful in a great way, like. Uh, depends on who you ask. <laughs> Um, sorry, finish that thought. Like, because you're a great ballet dancer, people care about the fact that you're also an electronic musician or a drag queen yourself. Exactly. You know, that's not a very humble thing to say, unfortunately, but that's just what happened. Um, towards late in the book, there's a description of what is required of ballet dancers that I thought was such a brilliant way of framing the task that is in front of you 
Um, this is the start of a chapter called Loathe, Revile, Abhor, Detest. Will you just like read the first paragraph of this? Oh, yes, absolutely. Let me, let me find it here. Okay, it's page 195 in my copy. Got it. Look at that. Isn't that a pretty book cover? I'm very proud of it. Okay. Gorgeous. Oh, I want to show the illustration here because just I love the illustration so much. Isn't that so good? James Fonda's workout. <laughs> so good. Um, while my opinion may be divisive, I find ballet to be the most undeniably athletic form of dance. It's just as physically difficult to lead sports, but presents additional challenges. Imagine if a weightlifter or a tennis player were asked to perform their tasks without betraying the difficulty of their movements. Now, I'd like you to ask those athletes to tell a story about human emotions and experiences with intuitive and expressive musicality. I'd like you to ensure that their bodies fit into a narrow range of acceptable dimensions. That's what a ballet dancer is, an elite athlete, an expressive actor, and a visual representation of music itself all at once. That was a kind of stunning moment when I read that. I was like, oh, right. What if Serena Williams were told she had to play Wimbledon Wimbledon, and act like it wasn't hard work? Like, that's what you have to do. That was, that was me trying to smile and hit a tennis ball. What'd you think? <laughs> I, the truth is, the honest answer is, you have been frozen on my screen for the last 10 minutes, so I've been seeing you in one pose. But now... You're unfrozen. You just unfroze. You literally just tennis. unfroze. Will you smile and hit a tennis ball again for me now that I can see you move? Sure. So this is me uh, doing tennis like a ballet dancer. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Actually, but, side note, there's an yeah. amazing piece of choreography that is like also, I think it's awful and also great. I'm confused. Um, it's a 70s video of uh, this ballerina that I'm obsessed with, Ekaterina Maximova. And it's a tennis ballet. Like they're pretending to do tennis, to play tennis. Uh -huh. And they're, she's in point, she's in a tennis outfit and it's like filmed for television. Yeah, I, I, you, you'll have Was to Google it. Was it in one of your Work Arena Wednesday Instagram posts? Because that's all I know of historical ballet dancing is what's it's in your Work Arena Wednesday posts. You know, then I must be doing something right because that makes me very happy. Um, it, I think I did actually post it at some point. I don't remember. I don't remember yesterday. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second here to um, take off my hoodie and encourage you to show participants in this session what you are wearing. And I will also remind people that they should be submitting questions that we can ask you, that I can ask you that uh -huh. this may be your one and only best opportunity to ask James Whiteside a question. So yeah, as I- questions. Yeah, it's toasty, isn't it? Okay, look that at this. Is. It's toasty here in Astoria. So this is uh, one of the illustrations from the book and it's part of the limited book merch thing that, that we were talking about earlier. And this is just really hilarious. It's a diagram of a gay pubescent millennial and it's disgusting as you can say, which really amuses me. And then uh, you want to tell one. us a couple of the things in that uh, diagram? Yeah, sure. Okay. One is acne caused by residual depth hair gel. <laughs> so gross and so one true. Is, one is a tongue ring and braces combo. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, this is good. Uh, contents of cargo pocket, unknown. Unknown. <laughs> <No. laughs> Uh, voluminous wide leg, low rise Jenko jeans. Did you ever have any Jenko? Wow. Uh, no, I wasn't stylish enough to have Jenko jeans, but I'm very aware of the trend. Oh yeah, it was a moment. Uh, this is a giant Nokia five one nine zero cell phone. I loved my Nokia cell phone. Um, as long as we're talking about teenage James, yeah. Another line in the book that really struck me was that you used to introduce yourself as James. Yeah. Would you like to explain why? Yeah, it's so sad, actually. So I 
believe it or not, I feel like I had the gayest voice, like even gayer voice when I was a teenager. Like something of, I, I hit puberty super late and I was just like, yeah, you know, like, hi. Yeah, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> when I would answer the phone or if someone would ask me my name, I didn't want to say, I like, try to avoid the letter S at all costs because I didn't want to seem gay. Because God forbid you should sound gay, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because So hi, I'm James. As I'm James. And I'd be like, hi, I'm James. Um, your coming out story is the way you write it. I mean, not coming out to your mother, which uh, like, but it gave me hives that you're basically like for the first time sort of like making out with a boy who you're really interested in and all of his and your friends burst through the door laughing because they bet on whether he could get you to come out of the closet that's like horrible you write it in a really charming sort of fun teen way but i was like this is a horror movie this is like like I was cringing so hard when I read that it was painful. Yeah, I I mean I got she's all that it. <laughs> but then you went on and like dated and had a nice little like teenage romance. Yeah, I mean I had no self respect, so of course like he showed interest in me after the bet was all won, and he ended up liking me, and I was like, sure, I'll date you. I'm sixteen. Now I'd be like, I'm gonna burn down your house. You're a sociopath, right? You're a sociopath, and all of your friends are sociopaths, and all of my friends are socio sociopaths. Um, somebody has asked a question, which is, have you ever gotten pushback from ABT management or donors for your outside activities or your big out personality? <laughs> um, not really, no. Um, I think they can't, like, legally. Otherwise, you know, that's a big issue. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. That's just good old-fashioned discrimination. So, no. But I I can sense it from certain people that I am too much. You know, I get, I always yeah. get really intense comments from some of the, the older patrons, honestly, they're just not used to this, which I get. I'm sure I'm going to be an old man someday, confused by the use. Um, okay, the essay in this collection that has justifiably gotten like the most attention, the most praise, the most conversation is about your mother, Nancy. Um, I think it's the longest piece in the book. It's incredibly powerful and it takes the reader on a journey. And what I wondered was whether and how writing this made you understand your mother in a different way. Seeing everything that my mother went through in one place was jarring. Uh, I am my mother's son. I have been through everything with her. I lost her in 2016 to cancer. But sitting down and putting it all in a in a story shape, I was I just couldn't believe how much stuff she had to deal with. It's just crazy. Did you find it hard not to judge her as you were writing it? I mean, she lived such a tragic life and there are so many struggles that you describe. As her son, I can only imagine how frustrating it must have been to feel tied to that journey, you know, w without having any say in the matter. I, I judge myself for how ju harshly I judged her as a teenager and in my 20s. Um, I, I have a lot of guilt, honestly, for, for my lack of empathy, frankly. Um, but writing it, I didn't feel judgment for her at all. I just felt sad. I felt guilty. And I felt moved by my siblings' stories of her and, and all the, the conversations we had together about her. 
it was mm -hmm. hard but really beautiful yeah you mentioned in the acknowledgments the um family phone calls or zooms that you had during the pandemic where you and your siblings would just like cackle about like sharing stories of your mother <laughs> i mean was that research for this book or was that just like let's get together and, and talk about her no it was research for the book i it was the height of the pandemic it was like april or something or may of 2020 and i was at my now ex-boyfriend's parents house in syracuse new york and i had taken over their solarium and made it my sort of writing space. I'm and sorry, I, who has a solarium? What is a solarium? A solarium is basically just a glass room that's on the end of your house. Okay, sorry, go on. Didn't mean yeah. to. No, I, I had never seen a solarium. That was the first solarium I had ever been in. And then they were like, oh, you're in the solarium. And I was like, I guess so, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, yes, I in wrote. the solarium. I, this is where I wrote the majority of, I don't, I don't know, I wrote a lot of the book in that room uh, with, with my now dead cat <laughs> farting on my lap. Um, Ms. Bid. Yeah, Ms. Bid. And I would do Zoom calls with my family and just like get the intel about my mother. It was, I learned so much about her through my siblings' experiences. Hmm. Um, there's something you write in your description of sort of her last day, and we don't have to go into too much detail about how that day unfolded, but you say art feels like complete nonsense until you realize how much you need it, how it gives you tools to survive in this world. Can you just talk about that sentiment, which I think is so well put? Oh yeah, I was, I was in the middle of ABT's Metropolitan Opera House season, their spring season. And I, I mean, I, I, I also just want to say, like, I don't like if I, I, I'm always hesitant to ask people to, like, relive trauma or perform their story of hardship. And so if you would rather gloss over, like, how the story concluded and just talk about sort of the significance of art, that is absolutely your prerogative. And if you would like to tell the story of how this long journey concluded, that is your story to tell. So I just want to give you two paths to choose and you can select whichever one you prefer. All right, that's a choose your own adventure. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I want you all to read the book if you haven't yet. Um, but, you know, I was going through um, essentially losing my mother, which happened very quickly and very slowly at the same time. Um, I was in the middle of the spring season doing big, huge classical ballets, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, um, Romeo and Juliet, you name it. And uh, every Sunday, which was the theater dark day, I would go and visit my mother and sit with her. And the, the season is eight, week, eight weeks long. And so, it, you know, I saw, I saw very real deterioration week by week. Um, and I think I almost like, I, still feel guilty for continuing to do my life uh, and like perform and put on a smile and kick and twirl for, for applause. Um, but at the same time, I needed it to cope. It, I don't know if distraction is the right word, but it was, it was the most natural way for me and for someone like me to just handle the, the very real visual details of, of losing my mother, who, whom I adore. How does that principle apply to the rest of your life outside of kind of the you know, tragic moments of life transition um, yeah. and the role that art plays more broadly? Well, I look at I look at my alter egos, JB Dubs and Yuhu, and those alter egos, as we call them, are are products of of need. They happened organically because I didn't feel like I was really expressing myself, um, and I, I don't know. That's a really good example of how art sort of just like happens to people who need it. 
um, you look at teenagers who are struggling with abusive parents or in tough social situations are um, not learning like other people. And you see that they gravitate toward drawing or they love poetry or they like to sing or they like to dance. And like art happens to people because they need it to. And, and I am very much that person. I mean, you're describing that from the perspective of someone who makes art, but I also think certainly for me, I would imagine for many of your fans who are attending this event, and I would assume for you too, as somebody who consumes art, it's a way to process the world and make sense of it as well. Like I, I sometimes feel like I learn more from my all things considered interviews with fiction authors than I do from my interviews with scientists, politicians, and business leaders. Like that's how we understand the world. Yeah, and there's a certain sensitivity that just goes along with connecting with art in your own way, whether it's creator or appreciator. I think the most sensitive human moments sort of weave life experience and art together. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we have another question, which is, what do you enjoy doing during your free time? Oh my gosh, I love reading. I read all the time. Um, I what love... have you read lately? What do you, what, what's, what's oh. the best thing you've read lately? Oh my gosh, I, um, I recently finished Andre, Gregor Andre Gregory's This Is Not My Memoir. A fabulous, oh, I don't know it. fabulous memoir. He's a writer, director, uh, playwright, and he's an old man and just his perspective is beautiful. Really lovely. It's a short book, read it in like, Three days, loved it. Um, wow. And I'm currently reading The Rhythm of War by Brandon Sanderson. It's the fourth installment in this epic uh, fantasy series. It's wonderful. So you journey widely in genres. Yes, I, I'm a big sci-fi fantasy fan. Um, and I love, I love memoir as well. Um, so with all the forms of expression that we've been talking about, how does adding the title author to that list of like drag queen pop star ballet dancer fit in with the the resume honestly i i'm skeptical i i just it's hard to believe that this exists you know i so much of what i do i do by feeling and um I wasn't sure what I was doing. Uh, I've never written before. I barely graduated high school. I'm not a super educated person. Um, but a lot of what I create is guided by feeling. And I feel like my author hat fits very nicely next to my ballet hat, my drag queen hat, my pop music hat, whatever you know, hat store I'm shopping at, uh, they all go together. Um, can you talk about how you became an author? Like how this came to be? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a fun story. So I was in the middle of a spring season at the, the Met Opera and I got a DM from a Penguin editor. Hey, I think you're kind of funny. Why don't we like meet up and talk about the possibility of, of you maybe writing a book someday? And so I met with my editor of this book, Gretchen Schmid, at the Reflecting Pool at Lincoln Center outside the Met. And we sat nice place for a first meeting. Yeah. And I was like, what is about to happen? I was in between shows, um, you know, at the, with, with ABT. And we were chatting. She was like, I think you just got like a really interesting voice. Like I can tell that perhaps you might, it might translate well to the page. And I was like, well, I've always wanted to do that. And I actually have the title of the book a hundred years ago. Wait, um, really? Yeah, when I was about 20, I was like, I wanna write a book and I wanna call it Center Center because it means the center of a stage, the center of the width and yeah. the depth. And um, that's, I mean, cheesy enough, as a, cheesy as it is, like I always wanted to be the person, you know, the lead basically. Yeah. Um, and I fought to get there. And so 
you know, I told her, I was like, yeah, I have a title already. It's like kind of delusional and insane that I do, but uh, I do. She said, no, all right, why don't you come up with some samples, some writing samples, and we'll see if we can get you hooked up with a, a lit agent. And so I went away and wrote for a bit, and, uh, and I talked to a bunch of agents, and I ended up with an agent at CAA, uh, Cindy, her name is. Gotta love a Cindy. We love a Cindy. And I, we built the proposal together with a, a couple sample chapters that actually, some of them ended up in the book. Um, Which was the first chapter you wrote? The first chapter I wrote, that's a really good question. I think it might have If you don't been, know, that's okay. I think it might have been All My Pets Are Dead. Oh, that's so funny. That would not have been my guess. Yeah, that's I think hilarious. that was the first one. I was like, I want to write about some... Also, in writing the book, I was like, I don't just want to write about ballet. That is, of course, that's, yeah. That's, that doesn't work for me. That's not my journey. Um, I needed ballet to be, you know, a big part of it. But I also wanted to talk about my dead pets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how you met Jesus on Grinder. I love that essay so much. Thank just, you. Will you just explain the premise of the How I Met Jesus on Grinder essay? You don't have to get into all the detail, but like what the essay is is genius. Okay, so. I talk about, I open the essay talking about how the number one question that people ask me is how did you start dancing? It's like, I don't know, it's just, it drives me crazy because it's just the easiest thing. It's like the most low hanging fruit. Um, and, you know, no shade, but a little shade. But in order to stomach the telling of how I started dancing, I decided to make up fake scenarios so the book itself has elements of fantasy peppered in, and this essay has a lot of fantasy in it. I go through three different tales, like three or four different tales that I made up completely about how I started dancing. One, I like get drunk with Martha Stewart when I'm nine years old. One, um, I get transported into another dimension by my hot pocket. Um, and one, I go on a date with Jesus Christ uh, from Grindr. And that one specifically is sort of like a bonus part of that essay. And uh, it's all, it's got a lot, like if you are a gay person who has ever used Grindr, you're gonna really get that one. Because it's, it's such a great essay. And buried among all of these fake stories is the real story of how you yeah, started dancing. Right. And if yeah. people wanna know how you started dancing, they have to buy the book because I'm not gonna ask you to answer that question now. Right. Um, uh, but I am gonna ask you to answer another question from one of the participants, Pam yeah. Shropshire, who asks, after writing this one, did it make you realize that you might have more stories to tell and what would the next one possibly be about? Oh gosh. I that's... think you should write a science fiction novel, but that's just my answer. I don't know, you yeah, answer would, for yourself. I would like to, um, I'm gonna try my hand at fiction. I would like to write a teen series very much. Oh, that's so great. Is it gonna have yeah. elements from your own life? Um, I don't wanna, I know what I wanna do and I don't wanna talk about it yet. Okay. But I'm Fair. manifesting, manifesting. I also wanna, um, it. I also wanna do, uh, you know, what is it called? Adapt some of these essays for television or film. Ooh, which one first? All My Pets oh. Are Dead? Oh gosh, I don't know. Well, it depends on what. <laughs> Just a procession of pets dying. I mean, hilarious. <laughs> it would be a great animated show. I would watch that. Yes, I, I, I would love to do an animated show. I'd like to do a sort of mini series or a, or a, a film um, about my mother. Um, yeah, I was like, people keep asking me who I'd want to play Nancy. And I, oh. I think Allison Janney would be a really amazing choice. Oh, amazing. I see her as like the mother from my Tanya, just yeah. slightly more Connecticut, less Oregon. Yeah, she's fantastic, I adore her. I'm, I mean, the thing that's so amazing about your mother's character is the combination of kind of the privileged aristocratic upbringing and then the reality later in life of just sort of addiction and financial ruin and hardship and how the former experience of privilege and aristocracy sustains even through the trials and tribulations of late in life. I sort of gave away the arc of her story there, but um, yeah, I would watch the hell out of that. <laughs> um, let's do last call for audience questions, things that you've always been dying to ask James. And meanwhile, James, let me ask how it feels to like show up to work and know that all of your like 
dirty laundry and deep dark family secrets are now like out there for the world to read for the low low price of whatever the book costs that's I'm sorry the lighting is so bad here. There we go. Anyway. Oh, wow. What a good how, how does it feel? <laughs> how, how is it feeling? I don't know. I ABT is not in session right now. We go back to rehearsals the beginning of September for our fall season. Buy tickets at abt.org. And um, I don't know. I don't know how to feel yet. Tomorrow night is a big release party, essentially, in New York City. Um, you can find the details for that on my Instagram if you want to come. There's going to be like a book signing and, you know, another chat. But essentially, it's going to be the first time I've seen my friends and colleagues um, since the book came out. And I'm nervous to hear what they say because, of course, they're my friends and I actually care what they think. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want, yeah. I want my loved ones to to love it. It's funny because I think, you know, in my field of radio, I'm very accustomed to doing a thing for an audience that I have no sense of, like whether one person or one million people are listening to a radio story of mine. I have no idea whether people love it or hate it. I have no idea. Like, and what you do on stage, like you get instant real time feedback reaction, like as a ballet dancer. And so now you're sort of in the position that I've been in my whole career where like you do a thing and like maybe you get some tweets or DMs or reviews, but like it is in the hands of the reader and the reader has an experience with it that you will have no knowledge of. And that has to require a degree of sort of like letting go of control that can be difficult, I would imagine. Yes, it is a strange sensation. I am very used to, uh, you know, instant gratification when it comes to my work. And this is a completely new feeling. Um, and basically, I want to ask all of you watching to share with me what you think and, you know, message me on Instagram or comment on one of my photos. Uh, and, and honestly, one of the most, you know, one of the nicest things you can do is just share it if you liked it with people in your life, with friends and family. You know, say, hey, read this book. I liked it. Or if you didn't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I loved it. And even if I didn't know you, I think that reading this book would make me feel like I do. And I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I get the sense that vulnerability comes really easily to you. But when I put myself in your shoes, it seems, no, it doesn't come easily to you. Because, like, this is a very vulnerable book. And I don't know, was it difficult to be like, I'm going to lay it all out there? Honestly, when I wrote it, I didn't think anyone would read it. I oh, wrote that it, helps. I wrote it like it was for me only. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not good at talking about things. <laughs> so this felt completely natural to me. It was, it's the most I've ever been able to articulate my feelings, honestly. Wow. It felt really good. And I, I wasn't scared to do it in a weird way, which I am very scared of doing in conversation. It just like freaks huh. me out. And you don't seem scared of talking about it either. No, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I mean, the alcohol helps, I'm sure. It must be the glass of whiskey I, I drank. Mm. Um, well, before you pour your second glass and we say goodbye, let me just ask if anyone else has a question for you that they're dying to ask. I um, would encourage everybody to buy and read the book. I really loved it. It's a delight and perfect for these waning days of summer. I am gonna, I'm gonna figure that in there. Anyway. Um. <laughs> oh my gosh. Ari, I just wanna say thank you so much um, for being not only an excellent friend for doing this, but for being so inspiring as well. <laughs> Oh, that's so sweet of you to say. Okay, we're going to end on this question. How did you meet Jennifer Garner? Okay, well, let's see. Well, she's a big ballet fan. Um, and oh. she she comes to the... to she's She was a dancer when she was younger. And uh, once you're a dancer, you're always a dancer. And she comes to shows, and we essentially just really hit it off and connected on Instagram and just became friends. It was lovely and 
talk about an inspiring person. This is a person who radiates goodness like nobody I've ever known. And she wrote a fabulous blurb for the back of your book. Angel, what an angel. What an angel. All right, well, James, congratulations. Thank you for the fabulous conversation, the wonderful book, and all of the wonderful performances that you've given us over the years. Here's to many more. Thank you, Ari, you're the best. Thank you both so much. That was such a wonderful conversation. Um, if you weren't convinced to buy the book after that, then I don't know. I mean, keep listening to more interviews, I guess, because I can't wait to read it. And you can get it at the green button. So please don't forget it comes with a signed book plate. I hope you got a t-shirt. Um, thank you both so much for joining us at Book Soup. It was really a joy to have you both and hear such a wonderful conversation between friends. And congratulations again, James. And thank here's you. to the next. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.